Excellent. So good evening, gentlemen. Um, today we have a special guest uh, called Dr. Andrew Tenley, who's a consultant cardiologist at the Southeast uh, NHS Trust, um, who's going to do a very good talk for us on um, complications on, on devices and, and things, um, surg surgical skills. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pass over to him. He's also one of the founding members um, of um, Peace for Life um, as well. So he's, he's very dear to us um, and we really appreciate him very, very much. Um, so this, this first talk, um, I think I'm led to believe that there might be many um, to follow later on from, from Dr. Tenley. Um, so I'm just going to hand over control to him and then he can start. So there you go, I'll make host. Uh, so make host, so I've, I've passed it. Right, you're the host. <laughs> Brilliant. Let me uh, pop that one up. So hopefully you can see everything. Yep. Brilliant. Okay. So thanks for those words, Julius. Um, very kind of you. So I'm Andy. I'm Andy Turley. I'm a cardiologist in the northeast of England. So I imagine most of you have seen or heard from Joel Dunning um, over the week. So Joel and I work in the same department. Um, and as Julia said, I'm one of the one of the trustees for, for Pace for Life. So this is this is great to be given the chance to have a chat to you. Um, so starting this, I wasn't quite sure how to pitch it based on the audience. Um, if you want to stop as I go along and ask questions, if Julius can keep an eye out, we can, or I can give you the talk and then we can have a discussion at the end. Um, so I've been a consultant since 2010, uh, where, where I work, there's 18 cardiologists, there's five, five of us that do EP and devices, um, and we split the team so that I own, I don't do any EP, I just do devices, so I probably put in the order of about 300 devices a year. Um, so this, this talk, Marginal Gains, you'll see why, where the title comes from as we get into it. Is really all around what you can do if you are in, already implanting or you've got aspirations to become an implanter, be that if you're a cardiologist, a surgeon, a physiologist, on just some of the things you can do to keep your complication rate as low as possible um, and why the device itself is one bit, but it's, it's everything that goes on in the operating room, the cath lab, uh, that is key to infections and complications. Um, that's just some of my disclosures. <clears throat> if anybody wants these slides, I'm more than happy to give them, give Julius access to them so he can share them. There's nothing in them um, that I'm particularly precious about. There's a few hyperlinks. ERA, which is the European Heart Rhythm Association, they have a consensus paper, which is well worth you having a look at. You can download it for free from on their website. They've got a consensus paper all around device procedures and all the evidence base behind what you what you should be do, doing in the cath lab um, to prepare patients and to keep complications as small as possible. So there's two schools of thought. So I, I've given this talk a few times. So I've given it nationally, I've given it locally, I've given it regionally. And certainly where I work in the Northeast, We've got eight different hospitals that are implanting devices. And when we first started talking about it, there was two schools of thought. One was we should be doing everything we can to keep device complications as low as possible. The other school of thought was, well, we don't really seem to have a problem. So why does it matter? Um, I think the attitude of we don't have a problem, why does it matter, is when you will run into trouble because that's when you become complacent about things. And when you become complacent, your standards drop. And as soon as the standards drop, you start to have complications. So if any of you are keen uh, sports people and into sport, the whole concept of marginal gains is a term that was coined by the British cycling team. So about 10 years ago, the British cycling team was so inept that rally, which is one of the main manufacturers of bikes in the UK, refused to supply the British team with any kit or equipment. 
because they were too embarrassed to be associated with them. They got a new chap in to head up the team and he coined this concept of marginal gain. So he basically looked at what goes on and what went on in British cycling, dissected it down and every little component he just looked at and said, how can we make that slightly better? So there was a problem with infections because the cyclists all lived together. So he got a surgeon in to teach them all how to wash their hands properly. The Lycra kit they were wearing was quite thick. So he changed the manufacturer of that and lost a few pounds. He looked at the how everybody slept. And rather than going from hotel to hotel, they had a wagon full of everybody's mattress so that when they were sleeping away from home, they slept on their own mattress and got a decent night's sleep. And bit by bit, by bringing in that concept, the team went from being one of the worst to dominating cycling for the last decade. So marginal gains is from sports psychology, but the concept is, is very real in any surgical arena. So what are we trying to prevent when we put in devices? Well, the, the, the worst complication you can get is a device infection. If you can see a device appear, even if you think the wound looks clean, that device is infected. Uh, depending on where you work, and within the UK, there are only certain centres that are set up to take devices out, removing Pacemakers, ICDs that have been in for some time is no fun. We used to do extractions in Middlesbrough. We stopped doing them because we weren't doing a lot of them. Um, but there is no doubt trying to take out wires from the heart and the SVC that have been in a long time does come with morbidity. And there's around about a 1% risk of mortality pulling out pacemakers. So the best way to avoid a situation like this where you can see the pacemaker all comes down to what you do at the time of implant and what you do at the time of generator change. So you want to prevent superficial infections. This almost certainly is a pocket infection. The trouble is pocket infections, once they occur, you've got bugs on the device. You get something called a biofilm over the device. And typically biofilms are incredibly hard to sterilize with antibiotics. And those biofilms sit on metal, sit on plastic, track down the leads, and then you end up with endocarditis. So as I say, if you ever see a device erode, that device is infected. Depending on the age of the patient, you may buy yourself some time by debriding it and repositioning the device but that will not get rid of the infection. It will reappear again at some point. So as we say, if you have a device infection, mortality rate is almost up at 20%. People need antibiotics. They're in hospital a long time. It's very expensive. Some people can't afford to be in hospital. Some people can't afford antibiotics. Um, so this is the worst complication you can get from implanting. <clears throat> this is a chap I met about 15 years ago. His wound had completely healed up. So this is all healed by secondary intention. You can see he's got a load of black tape all over his device because his device was programmed unipolar. And he'd realized if his device wasn't touching him, he got dizzy. So he, he'd cobbled this together himself and stuck it to his chest because he realized that's how his pacemaker would work. Um, but this guy's clearly got an infection and he pitched up to one of our emergency departments with dizziness. And this is what we found. So you will see all sorts the longer you've been putting in devices. So everybody has a perception. And when I ask my trainees and non-device implanters, so if I speak to the general cardiology colleagues I work with, Everybody has this perception that putting in pacemakers is incredibly low risk. And the, there's a hierarchy of devices. So pacemakers have the lowest risk, then ICDs, then CRT devices. But if you look at the big clinical trials, so the, the trials here are the somewhat dated now, but these are the landmark pacing trials. 
If you look at complication rates, you're getting anywhere between four and nine percent, depending on what your class is complications. If your subclavian root is your access of choice over your cephalic, you're at risk of pneumothorax, although you can still get a pneumothorax if you go cephalic from your if you use active fixed screws. So the screw, particularly of the atrial lead, can catch the right lung. So there is still a small risk of a pneumothorax with the cephalic approach, but it's much less than with a subclavian. You've got bleeding, you've got hematomas, you've got lead dislodgements. We track all the complications of all device implants in the Northeast, and we basically share amongst the eight implanting centers every year. And your atrial leads are more likely to displace than your ventricular leads. And ICD leads have twice the complication rate of right ventricular pacing leads. Um, if you're working in centers that put stents in and can do angioplasty, the chap in the middle, this is what happens if you put a device in somebody on dual antiplatelets. So this is aspirin and clopidogrel in combination. So aspirin and clopidogrel puts your bleeding risk up enormously you end up with an enormous hematoma and hematomas are what bugs like. So if you get a hematoma, you are much more likely to then get a device infection. And then the picture on the right is of an atrial lead. So the vast majority of uh, device implants in the UK will use active fixation leads. Very few centers use pre-shaped um, atrial leads. So there will be straight, you'll put the stilet down with a curve on the end to get it into the appendage. And then occasionally the leads fall out of the appendage. But if you have a lead dislodgement, you then have an early reintervention. And if you've got an early reintervention, your risk of an infection goes up significantly. So again, minimizing complications at implant, minimize the risk that you need to go back again and it's the subsequent procedures that put you at very high risk of infections. <clears throat> if you look at all the complications, so this is um, infections, everything. So your risk of infection from a first time implant is around half of 1%. So you have around about a one in 200 risk of an infection. Some of you on the call may not be getting anywhere near 200 implants a year, but collectively with time, and as we hope with Pace for Life, as we can get more and more pacemakers um, and make them more accessible and help set up units and proctor them to get them going, with time collectively, you will all be doing, when you pool your numbers, more than 200 cases. So you will see infections from time to time. Perforation rates from leads are similar. Pneumothorax rate runs around about one, one and a half percent in most places. And as I said, your lead displacement rate is twice as high for an atrial lead as it is for a ventricular lead. So overall, complications for a permanent pacemaker are around 5% when you put them all together. If you put it in dual chamber devices, so that's a one in 20 complication rate which is not that small. And if you had a 5% risk having major surgery, that would be classed as high risk. Then if you're doing more complex devices, due to a combination of the device itself, the leads are slightly different, the generators are bigger, and the patients are usually sicker, the complication rate is higher. So most people involved with devices underestimate the complication rate as do those who were referring in to you um, who may not be implanters. So this is just a view of what we do in the Northeast. Um, you don't need to worry about the numbers too much. As I say, there's different centers and you can see, depending on where you work, um, some centers implant a lot, some not many. The center I work at is on the left, so James Cook University Hospital. Um, this is just looking at purely at pacemakers. The blue line 
is what has been defined as the minimum number of implants a unit should do to be deemed to be competent. If anybody is setting up a service and wants some guidance in terms of what to aspire to, um, there's the British Heart Rhythm Society, BHRS. You can access their website and their guidelines for free, but they have a document on in an ideal world, accepting that this is written for the UK and our implant numbers will be higher, but in an ideal world, how many implants should a cardiologist be undertake, undertaking? How many should physiologists be involved with? And what should the setup of a unit look like? So if you are setting up units and you want some guidance, it's a good reference to have a look at. Um, but you can see within the Northeast, we have one unit in South Tyneside that only just scrapes the bare minimum number of implants. Um, and when you look at complication rates, you do see that those units that don't do very many often have higher complication rates than the units that do lots and lots. And it's like everything, the more you do of something, the better you and the team get at doing it. And this isn't just about the operating cardiologist, it's about the whole team involved in the device implant. And this is going to be a real challenge as you grow your services. So when you first start implanting, all you're doing is putting first time pacemakers in people who need a pacemaker. The longer you're going, so once you've been implanting devices for more than six or seven years, you will start to see people coming back needing box changes. Um, and in the Northeast, when you look at the work we do, it's around about one in five cases that we perform as a box change. Now, the reason that is important is it's the second procedure or the third procedure that is always much higher risk than the first procedure. So box changes are deemed very high risk for complications. That can be complications of damaging the leads. It can be complications of infection. So as a rule of thumb, your risk of infection doubles every time you do something to the patient. So if it's half of 1% for the first time, it's then 1%, 2%, 4%, 8%. Um, so box changes will appear and you will, with time, start doing quite a lot of box changes. The other issue with box changes, you will often pace patients because they have complete heart block. And when you come to do the battery change, Quite a few of those patients are completely reliant on their pacemaker. So when you disconnect the pacemaker from the wires, they will have no heartbeats. So you need to be prepared for that and have a system to do it so the patient is safe. Now, some of you may be doing box changes already. Um, but as you develop and grow your pacing services, box changes will start to become fairly common. Uh, cases for you and I know some, some of the work we've been trying to do is all around device follow-up and keeping people under follow-up so we can get them in before the battery does actually run out and likewise complex devices it's the same thing there are standards there on how many complex devices you should do but if you put the numbers for our region so in the northeast of England, we will do about 3,000 devices a year. If there's a 5% complication rate, that is 150 complications a year. If we can get that complication rate to go from 5% to 4%, actually, that has a big impact on our local population. And that's how you should be looking at it. Um, any small change is beneficial. This is data on, this is the Freeman Hospital in Newcastle. This is just some data they sent me about what are the risks of taking Leeds out. So for ourselves, we either send people up to Newcastle or down to Leeds, which is one of the other sites that remove um, pacemakers. So the first thing is Freeman don't do that many. So they do 30 a year. 
yet they get all the device infections in the northeast. So despite that, they're still not pulling out lots. The age of patients, you've got very young patients. Freeman is a pediatric unit and the transplant centre. And you've got very old patients. But with 30 extractions, two patients died. So that's a 6% mortality rate. So pulling the message is if you get a serious infection, the consequences of it can be fatal for the patient. In 2020, they had just under 30 extractions. And again, they had two deaths, um, one within 30 days and one following three months on intensive care, which clearly is hugely expensive. But again, complication or mortality rate of around 6%. So we know what bugs cause infection. The commonest speak or the commonest strain of bugs, a staphylococcus, usually coagulase negative staph. So coagulase negative staph are found on the skin. And the reason you get infections is that the skin may not be prepped properly. So you've got to pay attention to prepping the skin properly, sterilizing it, removing any hairs. Um, Staph aureus does cause problems. Usually with staph aureus, you know about it quickly because patients become very sick. Coagulase negative staph can grumble on for months and months before it declares itself. And it's the box change patients are the ones that turn up with devices eroding a year, 18 months down the line and you culture coagulase negative staph. Other bugs, much less common. So over 70% are staphylococcus. Now, every area will have slightly different resistance to antibiotics. So we'll touch on antibiotics in a minute. But in terms of which antibiotic to use, that will deter be determined a little by your local levels of resistance to antibiotics. Um, and it may well be a chat with your microbiology team is needed just to check you giving the patients the right cover. So what about antibiotics? I started training in devices in 2005. And at that point, our regime was oral flucloxacillin. You would do the procedure and you would then send patients home for a week with oral antibiotics. So it was standard to give antibiotics before the procedure, but we may give them two or three hours before. We do the case, then we'd send them home on antibiotics for at least five days. When you look at, this is a meta-analysis of all the early antibiotic trials, bearing in mind risk of infection is one in 200, when you put all the trials together, you only have 2,000 patients. So these trials are all grossly underpowered to actually answer any of the questions. <clears throat> so the problem with the early trials, they just did not have enough patients in to give you a clear answer. Then in 2009, the first proper randomized trial came out. So this is a study from Brazil where people were randomized and blinded. So they either got intravenous antibiotics or intravenous saline. It took people having a first time implant or box changes. And it was antibiotics at the start of the procedure and nothing else. And the trial was stopped early because there was a very clear message that giving intravenous antibiotics within an hour of the procedure significantly reduces infection rates. And that is what all the guidelines now refer to and what all the evidence says. So if you're doing a procedure, you should give intravenous antibiotics and not oral antibiotics. And they should be given within one hour of you making the skin incision. So in our hospital, we give the antibiotics when the patient is wheeled into the cath lab. So they come into the cath lab, we do a surgical who checklist, and we then give the antibiotic whilst we're getting the patient prepped and draped. 
So we know it's definitely being given and it's definitely being given within an hour of us starting the procedure. Denmark has a national system where every single device implant is entered onto a national database. And that's the only way the centers get reimbursed. So because that's the only way the centers get reimbursed, the Danish pacemaker database is incredibly reliant. So there's quite a lot of work comes out of Denmark when they go and look at the database. So if you take just under 50,000 patients and look at infection after pacemakers, there were one or two things start to come out in the data. So the first thing to say is your risk of an infection with your first implant is low. The risk of infection with a pacemaker replacement, so with a box change, is significantly higher. So do not let your juniors and your fellows practice by doing box changes before you let them start with first-time implants because you're letting them practice on the highest risk group. So when you look at factors, factors get split between patient factors and some patient factors you can modify, some you can't, and then procedure factors. So in terms of patient factors, you can't do anything about how old somebody is, what their gender is. Um, you can do things if they're on steroids, you can delay the procedure. If they've got indwelling lines of whatever form, again, if you can, delay the procedure. If they've got skin problems around the implant site, treat that first before your implant. So some patient factors you've got some control over, a lot you haven't. Now, the issue with procedural factors, and these all tie in to some extent. So the number of times you go into the pocket, so the more times you're in the pocket, the more manipulations you do and the higher the risk. That by default applies to patients having a device generator change. Long procedures are bad. So CRT procedures clearly are typically longer than VVIR pacemakers. So they come with an increased risk of infection. Hematoma formation is strongly linked with infection and hematomas are typically caused by surgical technique. Now it may be patients are on antiplatelets, but most hematomas come down to surgical technique. And if surgical skills are good, hematoma rates are low. So you wanna keep hematoma rates as low as possible. If you can have access to and can afford using diathermy for all device cases will reduce your hematoma risk. And the final one is not giving antibiotics. So if you don't give prophylactic antibiotics, your risk of infection goes up. If somebody's pyrexial, let the temperature and the infection settle for at least 24, if not 48 hours before you implant the device. Because if somebody's septic and you're putting wires in, there's a good chance the wires are going to get colonized and you've then got an infection on your hands. I know because of requests we get. Um, so when we set up Pace for Life, the, the whole ethos was to get pacemakers out to you and the teams to treat heart block. Um, and that heart block's got a clear mortality putting in even a VVIR pacemaker will protect people and stop them dropping dead. As different programs have developed, we know some centers are putting in ICDs and CRT. Other centers are just starting with their Brady programs. But if you start doing CRT and putting in extra wires, your risk of complications is very high. So this is a big American data set called Replace, looking at complications. If you have single or dual chamber pacemakers that you're needing to put extra leads in, again, your risk is high. So any procedure 
where you need to put an extra lead in and it may well be there's a problem with a bradycardia lead and you have to replace it comes with high complication rates um so again there's a clear message the more you do to patients and the more times you intervene on people the higher the risk give them a hematoma and your risk is 20 fold higher for infection <clears throat> So different conditions come with different degrees of risk. So having to go back early because you've got a lead displacement or you've got a tense hematoma that's causing pain that you have to evacuate comes with a significant risk of infection. We've talked about the differences between complex devices and bradycardia devices. The more leads you put in, the lot bigger the risk because that is a surrogate for the procedure time device replacements temporary wires are evil we try very hard never to put a temporary wire in because it puts risks up and doing procedures on people on steroids comes with risk we will pace patients on warfarin for metallic heart valves if they're on a DOAC for AF, we stop the DOAC for 48 hours before we do the procedure. And then we start it again 48 hours after. Some centres in the UK will do the procedures on the DOAC. Um, we found locally we've had problems doing that. And since DOACs are only licensed for AF, um, in terms of the cardiac indications, your risk of a stroke coming off a DOAC for three or four days is incredibly small. But warfarin, as long as the INR is three or less, we will implant without problems. We never or try very hard to never implant on dual antiplatelets. If they've had a stent put in, as long as it's four weeks after the stent, we will stop one of the antiplatelet drugs for five days before we implant and then restart it five days later. Other problems, chronic kidney disease puts your risk up significantly of both infections and hematomas. does not matter which device you're doing. Um, if you've got bad kidneys, you are high risk. A combination of heart failure and renal failure puts you at very high risk. So things that can be done. So it is recommended that you use chlorhexidine over iodine if you can get hold of it. Chlorhexidine is alcohol and it only works by evaporation. So if you put chlorhexidine on the chest and then take a swab to dry the chest, you're desterilizing the area. But I've seen that done on numerous occasions. If you use diathermy, and the chest is still wet because you've not let the chlorhexidine evaporate, and it takes one or two minutes at the most, if you use diathermy, because chlorhexidine is alcohol, it is flammable. And there's certainly been a case in the last three or four years in the UK of a patient being set on fire and the drapes catching fire because of that. So you just need to be aware of the importance of letting everything dry. The chest should be shaved, so there should be no hair on the chest. And it's recommended that you use electric razors, not handheld razors, because it handheld razors can cut the skin. We use disposable drapes because we have that luxury. Um, we also use this stuff called Iaban, which is yellow. It's got iodine in it. And once you've put the local anesthetic in the skin, you put the eye, you put the covering over the skin, and it means that there is then no visible skin that can be in contact with the device or the leads during the implant. Um, whether or not it significantly reduces infections is debatable. I do not know how much it costs. Then different centers will put things in the pocket at the end of the procedure. In the UK, it is fairly common that people will put 80 milligrams of gentamicin as liquid into the pocket 
after they've stitched up at the end. There is no evidence at all that it does anything useful, but it's one of the things that's been done for years by people in centers and gets passed down to others. There's a product called Collatamp, which is equine collagen, and it has gentamicin in it. And you can cut it and insert that into the pocket at the end. And the idea is it dissolves slowly over four or five weeks to reduce infections. There is some evidence it has some benefit in people having abdominal surgery. It's never been looked at and studied in people having pacemakers. But it's basically another means to deliver gentamicin. Then there's this orangey pouch, which is called Tyrex. Tyrex does have some evidence, and I mention it purely for completeness because it costs about £750 per pouch. So certainly in my unit, we probably use 10 of these a year at the most, and we do about 1,000 devices a year in the unit as a whole. Um, so we are very, very selective on who we give it to, and it's usually people who have, have had multiple procedures because it is just so expensive. If it was cheap or free, we'd use it in everyone. So this is this is the trial of Tyrex, and what the trial actually showed, so this is a study done by Medtronic, there was a lot of patients in it for a pacemaker trial. So there were 7,000 patients undergoing high risk procedures. So patients weren't having a first time bradycardia pacemaker. So they were looking at people having high risk procedures, box changes, upgrades, etc. But they stipulated in the trial that you had to be a high volume center to be able to use it. And the study came out statistically positive, but with a number needed to treat of 200 to achieve that. And if it costs £750 and you've got to put 200 in to prevent one infection, you can see why it is just so hideously expensive. And the problem Medtronic had was they picked experienced operators and the trial clearly shows if you are an experienced operator and unit doing high risk procedures with that experience comes low complication rates because they thought the complication rate in the control arm would be three to four percent. But it clearly shows that if you're doing a lot of something, you get good at it. So your risks of complications are low. I'm going to whiz through this bit. This is just the sums. Now, if you want guidance on where to go, we've mentioned the ERA guidance. If you go on the NICE website, and I need to update this, this has been updated. The NICE in the UK produce guidance on various things, but they do have guidance on surgical site infection. And the World Health Organization, and the link is at the bottom of here, have two papers that they published a few years ago now looking at preoperative measures for surgical site infection prevention and have gone through all the evidence base and has, have looked at this on a global perspective. So some of the key messages are, and we've touched on this already, is hair removal with electric clippers. So that should be the entire chest and not just a small area over the left shoulder. There's very strong guidance on the use of antibiotic prophylaxis prior to patients having insert or the implant of a prosthesis or an implant, which is a pacemaker. If procedures are very long, and certainly longer than the half-life of the antibiotic, which is the problem with flucloxacillin, flucloxacillin's half-life is very short. So if you're doing CRT and it's a long case or you're just learning to do CRT, you may have cases that go on for four hours. Plus, you may need to give further antibiotics. Skin preparation it talks about, and it talks about 
using chlorhexidine if you can get it. If not chlorhexidine, then povidine iodine. One of the th other things we've recently done, we had a spate of infections in our institution at the start, start of last year, it will have been. Um, so we went from never having an, an infection for over a few years to suddenly having four or five in the space of a couple of months. Um, we've put a stopwatch in our scrub room and make all operators scrub and wash their hands for five minutes when they're preparing. And since we've introduced that, we've not had a single infection. So that that's for the scrub nurses, the implanting cardiologists, the trainees. But we have a stopwatch on the over the sink and we just press start and it counts down for five minutes. And the trainees in particular, um, from audits we've done, we knew we're not washing their hands for very long. But just simple measures like that have a big impact on complications. This is the ERA document and you get a traffic light system. So green is do it, amber or yellow is think, red is don't do it. Now, some of these are controversial. Some of them are not controversial. So as we've already said at the top, allow sufficient time for antiseptic preparation to dry. Do not dry it with swabs. That just desterilizes everywhere. Using an adhesive impregnated incision drape, that is the Ayaban that we talked about. Some evidence, but not great evidence, and it would just add to the um, add to the cost. Oops. Um, using sorry, I've just put the chat up and it's completely distracted me. Bear with me. There we go. Um, performing the procedure with surg adequate surgical technique. Now, myself and Joel are, or have designed a surgical skills course. So we are running this, and it's kindly being funded by Abbott. So we are running a one-day surgical skills course in the UK in our centre. Um, it was due to be in June. We've had to move that for various reasons. It's now going to be in September. But the whole idea we hope of that course is we're going to run it in the UK. It's a full day course, but we think that course could then be replicated in Africa. Um, Joel is a thoracic surgeon. Um, it's a course on surgical skills. So we've designed it with surgeons involved. It is 90% hands-on and it goes through things, very simple things on just how to cut the skin, how to hold instruments, how to suture, how to tie knots properly, um, how to use diathermy, how to stitch leads in properly. But we are hoping we'll have a course that we that can then be replicated anywhere that we can share with people and get people in-house to run it themselves because how you handle the skin, hemostasis, how you control bleeding, all has a big impact on complication rates. The antibiotic envelope in high-risk patients, that's Tyrex. Um, some people, and we used to do this if we were trying to salvage a device. So if a device had eroded, we thought the patient wasn't fit enough for a full system extraction, we would either remove the can if they had, if they didn't have a pacing indication anymore, and bearing in mind quite a lot of people get paced for sinus node dysfunction. A lot of people with sinus node dysfunction will develop AF, and for most of them, when they go into AF, their initial pacing indication disappears. So occasionally you can just take the can out, um, or we'd rebury the device, and then we would take vancomycin grind it up in powder and put loads of vancomycin powder in the wound. Again, there isn't any strong evidence it works. Um, anecdotally, some patients seem to get away with it when you do it, but that, that isn't um, proof that the vancomycin was the bit that helped. Prepping and draping. There is a technique to prepping and draping and people need to do it properly. 
in our unit, we don't double glove, but it's one of the things I've got a meeting with my team on Friday to talk all about this, um, to look at where we are after our infections, what we've done to reduce infections and what we need to do next. And one of the things we're going to be talking about is whether or not we should be double gloving. Um, Put an antiseptic antibiotics in the pocket, no evidence. Now the talk about braided sutures for skin closure. So you can use something called Vicryl, which is what I use. It dissolves. It is a braided suture if you look down a microscope at it. So it's not one single filament. And there is some theoretical risk that it is harder to sterilize braided sutures compared to monofilaments. Now a monofilament would be something like monocryl. Um, the World Health Organization document have a whole section on this and in their document actually says there's no evidence one is better than the other and you should use a suture that you're comfortable with. So I certainly use Vicryl. A couple of my colleagues likewise use Vicryl whereas one will use monocryl. Um, Post-operative antibiotics don't give, doesn't work. And most patients will get a dressing put on their device for two to 10 days. We usually leave it on for two days, then take the dressing off um, and don't see many problems at all. So the ERA guidance, um, and there are similar documents from the Americans from Heart Rhythm Society, um, the ERA one's quite nice. It's got lots of tables, which are fairly straightforward uh, to follow. This is one of the other tables they have. And we have this printed out and laminated above the scrub sink. And the reason we've done that is the operators then are constantly being reminded about infection risks. So it's constantly on their mind. And when we do the huddle, we talk about it to keep everybody on their toes to try and stop complacency drifting in. So there's modifiable, and we've touched on quite a lot of these. Um, abdominal implants, Joel's got his hand up, or Julius may have. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Dr. Tiley. This is a quick question. Um, dissolvable or non-dissolvable stitches? Um, we, we all, well, we always use dissolvable. Okay. always have done when i was taught the, the consultant who taught me we put three layers in um so the consultant who taught me um always used non-dissolvable for the skin um but we since i've been a consultant i use vicryl for all three layers have never had a problem we do stitch the leads in with ethibond okay um, the unit I don't know what you do in Northampton, Julius. The Freeman in Newcastle will use Vicryl to stitch the leads in, but we yeah. use we use permanent sutures around the leads. Yeah, exactly the same, non-dissolvable and exactly the same. Yeah, um, very similar. What you should not use is do not use silk. Um, silk leads to sterile abscesses. Um, and speaking to Joel previously about it, silk was never designed to be left in the body. So if anybody is using silk sutures, you will have problems just because of the way the body reacts to the silk from time to time. So you should be using Vicryl or something similar. Um, Non-modifiable, a lot of this, as I say, summarizes what we've talked about, but it's just in one nice chart. Um, think about why you're putting the pacemaker in. Now, for a lot of the patients in Nigeria, and I assume it will be a similar case mix to what I saw when I was working in Ghana, um, for the majority of your patients, it's going to be complete heart block. So they're going to have a very strong indication for a device. Um, but always think, does the patient really need a device? That becomes more important, or not more important, but that you need to think about that, particularly if you're starting to get into... ICD therapies and primary prevention ICDs. Um, I appreciate for some units that's going to be quite a way off, um, but the risks benefits from ICD therapy is often more nuanced. Give an antibiotic at the start of the procedure, whichever antibiotic you use, 
we have used kefuroxim for the last eight years at, in Middlesbrough. Um, from the beginning of April, we are switching to intravenous ticoplanin because kefuroxin in our population does not cover coagulase negative staph to the level we want it to. If you're using ticoplanin, it is more expensive than kefuroxin and it has to be given over five or 10 minutes. Otherwise, patients can have an anaphylactic re reaction to it. So it's not as easy to use. And then at the bottom are just a few pointers. Postpone the procedure if the patient's unwell with a fever or infection. Treat comorbidities as well as you can. Think about anticoagulants, antiplatelets. Think about operators. Um, so if we've got trainees with us, the trainees often will start by doing bits of the procedure. We won't let them start by doing all of it straight off. So they'll do certain bits until they become competent. And then the consultant will take over to try and keep procedure times at an adequate level. Limit the number of people walking in and out of the room. The problem with cath labs in the UK is they're often used as storerooms. So certainly the room I'm in did have, until a few months ago, lots of cardiac stents in it. So people would just walk in looking for a stent for another lab. We've now rearranged where things, things are kept. And we have a sign up on the device lab saying if the procedure is underway, people cannot just walk in. We have a microphone system and they've got to ask us if they can come in and why they want to come in. Um, you need to limit how many people are around the, the important part of the table, how many IV lines, temporary wires, etc. So there's lots of little things. But if you think of each of these and make a minor change, this is where this concept of marginal gains comes in. Surgeons have been using risk scores for years. This is Euroscore. So this is what the surgeons use to calculate a patient's risk if they're having cardiac surgery. We look at factors related to the patient, factors related to the heart, and then what operation they're going to do. This is mandated on consent for patients. So scoring systems in cardiology and cardiothoracics are well established, but within device therapy until recently, we've not had anything. This is a really important trial that you need to be aware of called PADIT. PADIT is a big trial. It's 20,000 patients performed in North America. And the trial was set up to look at antibiotics. And it was basically looking at three procedural antibiotics. So the regime used in the Brazilian study that we talked about versus a more enhanced antibiotic regime where people got combination antibiotics. They then got a pocket wash and they went home with oral antibiotics. And they were looking at the one year risk of hospitalization for device infection. And what they actually found was there's no statistical difference. Therefore, the conventional regime is both simpler to give and significantly cheaper. <clears throat> What they did, however, as part of doing this, they developed a score called the PADIT score. And that score predicts an individual patient's risk of infection. It works and it performs much better than the current system we use for working out who needs an ICD if, the, if they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So the scoring system was developed in 20,000 patients and has since been validated. So we use the PADIT score not as a tool to decide what we're going to do with a patient, but we, we, we use it to help us consent patients. And we use it in our huddle because, again, it means all the cath lab team are constantly being reminded about complications and infections. And we think that is a good thing. So pad it, each letter stands for something. So prior procedure, most people think operating on young people is low risk. It is high risk. Now that is almost certainly to do with how the heat, the skin reacts, the wound heals, and they're going to need more procedures. 
bad kidneys we've talked about, being immunocompromised. Certainly in Ghana, HIV infection is common. Lots of people have HIV. Lots of people have hepatitis B and C. Um, so being immunosuppressed for whatever reason is bad. And then the type of procedure. And you get points. And the more points you get, the higher the risk. There is a calculator online that will calculate it for you. But you can see the minute you do device revisions or upgrade, and a device revision is just going back in, your Padit score goes up to five. So the more points, the bigger the risk. If you get over seven, that is deemed a high-risk procedure. So we think Padit has some merit in terms of keeping awareness around infections and helping with consent. This is what you see. This is Ozzy as a colleague of mine in Manchester. They looked at the American Medicare system, so healthcare claims, and the PADIT score performs exactly as the trial did in a real life population. So, every one point increase in PADIT, your relative risk of infection increases by almost a third. This is where virtually at the end you'll be glad to hear. So, these are two patients. And the question is, who's the higher risk patient? Is it the 82-year-old who had a primary prevention ICD put in some time ago, who's never had any therapies with slightly bad kidneys, who's coming for their third procedure, or is it the 59-year-old paced for AV block on their third procedure and had been upgraded to CRT? Because this is where PADIT may come in, in terms of how you consent patients. So the younger patient is much higher risk of needing hospitalization. You could argue at 82 with a primary prevention ICD at, with no therapies, whether or not that patient should be getting considered for a box change at all. And certainly in our unit, we'd be having a chat to them saying, you probably don't need an ICD. Um, and we just leave the device in and do nothing. So marginal gains, could you do more? I'm sure if you go away and look at your practice and look at each step along the way, there are probably areas where things could be tightened up. And even if it's just small little things, such as a stopwatch in the scrub room, limiting the number of people in the room, looking at what antibiotics you give. Um, but these, this slide on the right in the green is the key one. And again, we've got this picture printed out and laminated in our scrub room. So when the operators are scrubbing, they've got this picture, they've got the chart you saw a little while back, and then they've got a picture of a horrible device infection right in front of them. So they're constantly being reminded of it. Um, and as I say, since we've in instigated a whole load of new ways of working. Thankfully, we've not had a significant infection since. So I will stop there because the next couple of slides was me um, selling Pace for Life to some of my colleagues at home to get them to volunteer to go out to Ghana um, and take, take any questions. I shall stop sharing, Julius, and hand back to you. Questions or discussion? Yeah. Thank you for that, Dr. Telly. Has anyone got any questions? That was fantastic. Thank you, Reed. That was brilliant. And I like I like the way your 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 voice is like really quite eased. Was that deliberate? No, no, no. That's just that's just, yeah. I've given lots of talks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's really good because you can follow it. And um, some sometimes, obviously, people in Africa find it difficult, like yeah. to follow people here when you speak too quickly. Um, and that, so that, that was really good. Because I've got quite a strong um, UK accent as well. <laughs> oh, it's lovely. It's lovely. <laughs> Has anyone got any questions? Dr. Daffy, I know you do. <laughs> Get everyone off. <laughs> so, so I don't know if anybody wants the talk. If you do, I can send a link to Julius to... I don't know what you record them, don't you? I don't know if you how you get access to the slides, Julius, but 
Yeah, we do. We, we recorded it to cloud, so yeah. you know, download it and 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 send it across to to the yeah. chat groups. And they've got uh, the, and um, the things. Just yeah, some of those papers are. If you've no, never read the papers, um, certainly the, the era one is quite easy to read. The American guidelines. I, I don't know if AJ seems AJ is on. Um, not having a pop at the Americans, but the American guidelines are quite hard to read because there's just lots and lots of text and not many charts or graphs. Whereas yeah. European ones seem to have lots of graphs, which just make it a little bit easier to get the key facts out of. But they all say the same things. Yeah, yeah. No offense taken. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you had a question earlier, which I think you, you answered it. And uh, I saw that flash up, which is yeah. almost yeah. 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 crazy because I tried to look at it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, we do, we do use that. We do use Vank powder, but um, none of these... Other than Tyrex, there's absolutely nothing has been shown in the pocket to do much. And whilst Tyrex has benefit, as I said, a number needed to treat of 200 when it's 750 UK pounds. Um, that is very, very expensive to treat one, to prevent one infection. You would be much better putting resources elsewhere. Um, I don't know, AJ, if Tyrex is used commonly in the States. I know in the UK it's not. It's it's actually really common in the US, especially in teaching institutions. Um, but they, um, it, you see it a lot for like gen changes or those, those higher yeah. risk where you're reopening a pocket, things like that. Or if we start to go really long in a procedure, the physician may turn around and be like, can you grab a, a Tyrex off the shelf? Yeah, I guess you're insurance based as well, aren't you? So there's a, there's a re reimbursement mechanism in the uk it it didn't get through the cost effectiveness analysis for nice so nice have not approved it so if a hospital mm. uses it the cost comes out of the hospital's budget well yeah so dr Tanley, that's really interesting so some we sometimes get um expired irx pouches some sometimes when we're going across to like um, you know, to Nigeria, we send we send them there for Dr. Daffy. What how what would you say was a sort of like the limit for using a tyrex pouch? Like if it's it if is it's all, if it's expired, the pro the problem with Tyrex is the antibiotic that's on it. Yeah. So whether or not the antibiotic because Tyrex has got a few features. It's it's there's a pouch. Um and it's then got the antibiotic as well. It's not just an antibiotic. It, it, there's other things it does. So if you're putting it in and it's expired, you may, the antibiotic aspect may be minimal. Okay. Um, but it does seem the, the next generation Tyrex, they're on Tyrex 3 at the moment. Um, so they're looking at putting other agents on it to reduce risks of hematomas. Um, so the benefit of Tyrex is high risk patients. So as AJ said, box changes, CRT upgrades. Um, those would be the patients. It would not be first time implants. If you put it in first time implants, you don't need it and you're wasting it. Um, the other issue with Tyrex, those of you that have come across it, you need to soak it in water to soften it up. And then with the current Tyrex that we, we can get in the UK, and I don't know if Tyrex 3 is out in America yet, um, the edges are quite sharp. So you then got to turn it inside out. The next Tyrex pouch that's coming out will be easier to use. You don't need to turn it inside out. The edges aren't as sharp. And it's a little bit bigger. Often with the current Tyrex, you've got to widen the neck and cut the neck to fit the device in. So it's not the easiest thing in the world to use. Um, silk. Oh, yeah. So silk causes um, a ster uh, sterile abscesses. So you'll get a fistula from where this, the silk knot is to the outside world is the problem with it. So you should not be using silk to tie leads in or, gener or to secure in generators um, because the body can react to it. 
Now, if you can only get hold of silk, so be it. But if you can get hold of other suture material, you should be using that. Um, so as I say, silk, although it's been used, was never designed to be used internally. So if you put in temporary wires or things in, it's great to use to, to secure stuff externally, but it shouldn't be used around leads. So I think certainly UK practice, the vast majority of units, I used to mark the British Heart Rhythm Society do an exam. Um, so I used to chair the exam and mark lots of log books. The vast majority of units in the UK will use Ethibond to stitch their leads in with. And Ethibond is not that expensive. Another question from Elvis. What about the use of nylon sutures? Yeah, I, don't, I don't know the honest answer, Elvis, because as I say, I've my practice has always been um Ethibon around the leads, bicral to the wound. And then in terms of the last layer closing the skin, people use um monocryl, which is a bit like fishing wire. So we'll have some nylon properties almost certainly. Um but around the leads, I don't know, is the honest answer. Do not know. I've not heard of so if you go to meetings, it, they'll, they will often bring the issue up about silk, but I've never heard it raised about any other material. So I think it is specific just for silk. So if you're using nylon around the leads, you're probably all right. Yeah, Do Doctor Isako just said that, like they use nylon for the leads. Yeah. yeah so I think I think they I think nylon, you're probably okay. But if you are using silk and you can move away from it, I would. Are you all, can I just ask, are you all using intravenous antibiotics? Because the one the one thing, if, if, if you're not doing any of this, and I'm sure you're doing quite a bit of it already, but the one thing that will give you the biggest impact will be to use intravenous antibiotics as your pre-med for the cases. Um, IV keftriaxone, yeah, that's fine. Um, so if you're using oral antibiotics, an easy win is just to switch straight to intravenous antibiotics. Um, but if you're all doing that already, um, and the key is, to, as I said, the timing of it is important. So you want to give it within an hour or so of doing the procedure, no longer than that. Yeah, th thank you very much, Dr. Andrew. Very great presentation. It's Dr. Emmanuel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, my network has been going in and out. Is uh, that is the reason? So <laughs> very great presentation. We learned so much from this uh, presentation today. Um, as you said, um, the time, uh, the preparation of the patient is very important to avoid complications. Extremely very important. Then the use, uh, there are some questions that we are going on on the on issue of sick and um, and uh, lylon. Yeah. Uh, one thing about the, the sub-Sahara Africa, you don't have access to everything that you need. Yeah, no, sure. In the sub-Sahara Africa. Yeah. So we make use of these ones because we don't have access to some of these uh pacemaker uh, sorry the uh, social routinely yeah. for example if uh, you are anchoring the uh, delete you can use we do use either line long or sick then if you are closing in all our closure we use uh the vicry in three okay. layers we use the vicry to close yeah, and sure. it gives us uh, a good result then the pre-preparation uh, antibiotic, uh, hour to two hour, we usually give the antibiotic and it gives us a fantastic uh, result. Yeah. So I don't think that we have ever implanted any device without the use of uh, pre-antibiotic. And the common medications we use here are the cetriazole. Uh, augmentin is uh, amoxicillin. Okay. Uh, uh, Amosis slim with um, uh, this, uh, 
Yes, a, a very good. Thank you, Dr. Mbadiwe. So amosicillin and clavulinic acid, we use the, uh, we also use that. So sometimes we also use uh, uh, depend on your evaluation of the case before the implant. Sometimes yeah. I, I do request for uh for ceftazidine, but that is very rare. But most okay. time is ceftrazo and um, um and clavulinic acid. So, and they give us a good result. And as I said, in the South South Africa, uh, you use what, uh, what is available for you. Then another key issue in the plantation in the South South Africa is that you have to get, prepare your patient, the skin very well. So we do multiple preparation of the skin here, uh, uh, Dr. Andrew, uh, multiple preparation of the skin in the sense that uh, we prepare the skin before, uh, before uh, a day before then, ask the patient to take his bed, uh, clean that uh, the the upper uh, uh, the upper uh, chest around the clavicle, clean it very well with soap. And uh, when the patient get to the uh, to the cat lab, you can also do preparation with some antiseptic before you go and. Um, and uh, you, uh, you wash your hand for about five minutes, then you wear your sterile uh, gown, you come in and start the preparation again. And all this has helped in one way or the other, or the other even though there are, no, uh, a, there are no studies to show them, um, they do help in one way or the other. A lot of implants, physicians are with us on this uh, page. I think they also have similar uh, experience from their own implanting uh, hospital and site. Uh, I have a question. Um, when the, uh, have you ever put a patient to, on either you sedate a patient in any form during your years of implant, Dr. Andrew? I'm asking you this because I um, ordinarily when we are implanting, we don't uh, we don't need general anesthesia. Neither do we need deep sedation in any form. Um, we use local anesthesia to do all our implants. Uh, but a, a few years back, I had a patient who had a symptomatic bradycardia and had. Uh, uh, on the background of the symptomatic bradycardia, this patient also have uh, dementia with Alzheimer's, uh, elderly woman, I think around 86 years old at that time of the implant. So uh, the lady uh, on the background of the dementia and um, Alzheimer's uh, had symptomatic bradycardia that also gave her uh, ischemic stroke. So she was restless and she can't obey any uh, order. So during that implant, I have to, while we are planning it, we have to bring in the, uh, the, the, the anesthetist who gave us sedations and the lady was very quiet throughout the implant. And after the implant, this, uh, to our surprise, the lady did very well, extremely very well. Even uh, the, assign, uh, the uh, dementia seems to improve the stroke also improved, our uh, coordinations and awareness also became uh, extremely far better than what even the family uh, predicted before the implant. So I just want to know what you do for selective patients of this category, sir. So like you, like you all our, our default is all our procedures are done under local anesthetic. Um, we we really struggle to get an anaesthetist for general anaesthetics. Um, so our default, and even for patients like that one, would be to do it under local. So we probably do it very similar to what you did in that case. We use bubivacaine as our local anaesthetic over lignocaine just because it lasts longer. So we think it gives yeah. better pain relief after the procedure. Um, 
we're just about to switch and give everybody intravenous paracetamol. Um, but we commonly, certainly for our ICD and CRT patients, use sedation as standard. So we typically will give all the patients a combination of midazolam and fentanyl. So we, oh. use, so we usually give them 30 micrograms of fentanyl and one milligram of midazolam at the start. Mm. See, see what effect that has, because on some people, that's all you'll need. We know the other patients that won't touch them at all. Um, and then just increase, keep increasing it by a milligram of midazolam, either 20 or 30 microgram increments with fentanyl. Um, but we don't have any anesthetic support in the cath lab. So if we are using sedation, then usually one of the nurses in the team is responsible to keep an eye on the patient as to how sedated they are. The other thing that works, we found works well with patients with dementia. We got a little handle that slots under the cath lab table. Um, and that if patients with dementia have something to hold on to, they often, okay. become, they often become less agitated. So we used to we used to have a nurse sat next to the patient on the opposite side to you as the implanter. But what would happen is they'd hold the patient's hand and the patient would just squeeze it so hard. The nurses were coming out with hands that were <laughs> sore and bruised. So what, <laughs> one of our radiographers came up with this, this handle idea and it definitely seems to work and help people. Good. Thank you, sir. That's, I still have another question. Um, do you generally at your uh, hospital um uh, uh, also use a suture to hold the battery no. apart from the lead no so we only will the only time we we do do that but the only because time, we do it in our center right um the only time we do it is if we've got very big obese patients because we've had times where you've put the device in, you think it's up near the clavicle, and then when they stand up, it drops a mile and pulls on the leads. So if we've got somebody who's very big, mm. we, we will then stitch the device in as well as the leads. If somebody's of normal build, we normally wouldn't. Um, okay. if, if, if we do stitch it in, we always use Vicryl. We never stitch it in with Ethibond. Um, so the the reason for that, or our argument for that, is once the pocket is developed, the de device yeah. the device won't move. And having done some box changes where devices have been stitched in with Ethibond, it can make the box change procedure really difficult. Um, so, so if we're going to stitch it in, we would use a dissolvable suture. Suture, yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, yeah, we, we do we do the same as well. Um, okay. We use the same indication in Northampton that if you've got um, um, a morbidly obese person where there's a likelihood of the device actually moving within the pocket, then you you would suture it in uh, for this for the same reason. We've got a few questions here um, okay. in the chat group from Dr. Seko. Says, what do you think about our relatively low device rates in the development of the practice in Nigeria? So I, th well, firstly, we hope your device rates start to improve, which is the whole ethos of Pace for Life. So as you're probably well aware, um, Pace for Life was, is, the whole purpose is to get free devices out to sub-Saharan sub Africa and other places, other, other countries where patients can't afford them. Um, as part of that, there's this, the Sunday night, program of education we're also in the midst of organizing a whole lot of missions where teams can come out and help support you to develop um so the whole idea for the missions is that the missions don't come out and do the work because that doesn't help you guys the whole idea of our missions and what we've done from the start with pace for life is come out to centers who want to put in devices give you a helping hand talk to you, give you some advice on the ground, but 
very much get you guys to be the ones doing the implants so that when we leave after a mission you can then carry on implanting we are so i'm hopefully so as well as a trustee for pace for life i'm a trustee of arrhythmia alliance so we have pitched to industry um so some of the companies that make mobile monitoring devices about how we can set up a screening program to go and find patients who need pacemakers because you, you in your country you will have lots and lots of patients with complete heart block you you know that it's just finding them and the ones you get to see are the, are the tip of the iceberg there, there are devices you know the, the simplest device is the alive core device that you can use with an iphone it records a 30 second ecg rhythm strip that's all you need um the headache is a live car don't have a license in africa so we can use them in africa but there's a there's some logistics to get the devices set up before they get to africa otherwise they get blocked um but we are looking at ways in which screening programs could be used to find the patients we had a chat with a team in america last week where basically the team said they've got 8,000 pacemakers, could we use them? So getting devices isn't the difficult bit. We can get the devices out to you. What we want to do is make sure we, you and your teams have got the skills to put them in. You've got the infrastructure there, and we can find the patients. Um, there's also My Heart, Your Heart, doing a big randomised trial of looking at reconditioned pacemakers versus new pacemakers and we're keen to try and get implanting centers to be part of that trial because you then get the devices free and you also get paid to do some of the follow-up visits as well um, so there's all sorts of initiatives bubbling away that we're trying to work through to try and help you address the low implant rates um, but you know, to put it in perspective, when we started with Pace for Life, it was it was handed to us by a chap called Lavan. He'd sent out something like 15 pacemakers in the year before we got involved. In the last six months, we sent over 200 pacemakers out. And as I say on the call last week, we were basically told by the, some colleagues in America they've got 8,000 pacemakers. They just want to know what to do with them. So getting the devices to you is is the simple bit. It's everything else. There is another. Thank you for that. Okay. There, is, there is another. I question. have a question. Oh, yeah. I have a question. Okay, for our way. That's somebody. That's somebody. Way. Um, actually, I'm also a, an, uh, an implant in the eastern Nigeria. Uh, talking about really. Uh, Anchoring the pacemaker, yeah. the generator. Uh, yeah, uh, it's interesting to know that you don't really necessarily anchor the generator because what we are wondering is uh, what we are worried is that sometimes this um, thinking that it can wander, you know, what they talk, uh, what they call wandering right. pacemaker. So that is why here we usually suture it to the pectoralis muscle and uh, we use non-absorbables also it is possible that if he wanders it will affect the lead position although the wire there should be able i mean the leads if it's long enough should be able to take care of that but these are the concerns we have yeah. and i i I'm, I, yeah um it's interesting to know that you people don't worry about it and you never had issues or complications from not having it sutured, you know, to the uh, to the muzzle. So, so I don't know what you have to say about it. Yeah. Know. So in most patients, if if you make the pocket, if the pocket's in the right place, yeah. So if the pocket is just in fat, and you put the device in the fat, it will it will move. If, yeah. If your pocket is truly prepectoral and you can see the muscle, yeah. If, as long as your pocket isn't too big the pacemaker, okay. the pacemaker shouldn't go anywhere um if you need right. and you know julius does in the, in the team in northampton do the same if you're worried you can you can you can anchor it there's 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 nothing wrong in anchoring it 
The only thing is if you're anchoring it with non-absorbable sutures, it's just important to make sure that that is well documented for the person who changes the battery. Okay, okay. Because yeah. right. right. they're going to have to go looking for that suture to cut the suture before they'll be able to get the device out. Um, now, if, it's, if that's the way you do it in your unit and the patients are going to have the battery change in your unit, everybody yeah. will know that. There'll be a there'll be a suture there. Yeah, there's absolutely nothing wrong with anchoring it, um, but as I say, our practice is unless the patients are morbidly obese, we we don't routinely anchor. If the patients are very obese, we always anchor because we know the devices move all over the place. Um, so it just comes down to personal pre preference, but you're not you're not doing anything wrong by anchoring it. Right. Thank you for that, uh, Dr. Tanley. So there is another question in the chat group. Please, could you repeat your protocol for patients on DAPT within a month of PCI? So, so the, for for ourselves with DAPT, the main problem is primary prevention ICD patients. So they come in, have an ST elevation MI, get a stent, have severe LV impairment, and we then get asked to put an ICD in. Those patients are easy because it's usually three or four months after their acute infarct. So your risk of stent thrombosis is high in the first four weeks and then drops significantly. So if they are if they've had a stent in for more than four weeks we just stop the second antiplatelet and that might be clopidogrel, prazogrel, ticagrelor, but we would stop it five days before the procedure, put the device in, and then we start it again five days after the procedure. So they're off it for 10 days altogether. We do not reload them and we've not had one case of anybody having stent thrombosis by doing it. If you have somebody who has, you know, somebody comes in with an inferior infarct, is on DAPT, and you've got to bear in mind that the only group that really benefit from dual antiplatelets are those patients with a stent. So if the patients have not had a stent put in, your risk of stopping the second antiplatelet, even in the first three or four weeks, is very low. So it's only the people with stents we worry about. If they've had a stent and it's within four weeks, we do the case on dual antiplatelets anti because we've got no option. But we warn the patient that they are at a bigger risk of a hematoma. And we make sure it's one of the consultants that puts the device in and not one of the trainees. So you get your experienced operator to do it. Well, I hope that kind of answers the question. I, mean, I don't know how easy it is where you work in terms of what your options you've got in terms of PCI and stents for people with acute coronary syndromes. The question's specific for PCI, isn't it? So I'm presuming they've all got stents in. I haven't reread it. Yeah, well, the person who asked it is not is not answering that. So, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Is, has anyone got any more any questions? Any more questions? Jared, have you got any questions? AJ, you've already asked one, but if you've got any any yeah. more. Oh, somebody's got your hand up. Um, Dr. Alajime. Um, yeah, far away, Dr. Alajime, ask your question. Okay, thank you very much, sir, for the great presentation. I just have um, a funny question to ask. Um, when draping the image intensifier for your before your procedures, do you choose which one do you really choose? Do you drape them after you've you've um, draped the patient, or you? cover your image intensifier even before draping your uh, patient? 
we will well we've usually there's usually two people so we've got the luxury although i can see lambert's on the call um in kamazi that did this as well um so we'll have a scrub nurse and the operator so what usually happens so in our lab the scrub nurse will be prepping the patient our image intensifier is away from the patient so the operator goes and sorts out the image intensifier so the sort of both things happen at the same time. Um, if you're going to do it, I if if you if there's one person doing both, I would drip the I would sort the image intensifier out first. So I've certainly seen people de-sterilize all the drapes on the image intensifier because that's not being sterile first. And when they've put the drapes on, they've caught the image intensifier. Um, and there was another question about okay. diathermy I saw appear that I think may have disappeared. Um, I don't know if diathermy has any evidence in any randomized trial of influencing outcomes. Um, we don't do any procedure without diathermy. Um, in terms of hemostasis, if you can afford diathermy and the, the, the diathermy tips themselves, certainly in the UK cost about one pound. It's the machine itself, the expensive bit. But if you can afford diathermy, I would strongly encourage you to do every case with diathermy. Um, there's, there's a really expensive uh, device called plasma blade which is very expensive, which is said to be mar or is marginally better than diathermy at dissecting, but is nowhere near as good as diathermy at coagulate coagulation. So my preference is any case I do, diathermy is the standard. Um, I don't do any case without it now. But whether or not there's any evidence to back that up, I honestly do not know. Uh, Dr. Andrew, we don't even have plasma blades in, Niger uh, in Nigeria. I don't think, I don't know of anywhere in the sub saharan Africa where we have plasma blades. I think plasma uh, is an expensive toy. Yes, you don't but need we have diatomy yeah. very commonly around here. Yeah, I would use diatomy. Can you hear me? I don't think plasma blade adds anywhere near as much as the huge increase in cost would justify. Um, sure. I know. I know. When I was out in Kamazi, the, the team in Kamazi have exactly the same diathermy machine as we have back in the UK. Um, you can buy diathermy pens; they're absolutely useless. Um, so, if you can get access to diathermy, I would just stick with using diathermy. Uh, how much hardware are they, by the way? Is it something that pays for life and sorts out? Oh potentially i mean i mean for me the benefit of doing this is hearing where the challenges are so pace for life can secure ethibon sutures if you guys wanted those over silk so if there if there are areas that we've talked about that you can't access in sub-saharan africa we can try and source them from our side and get get stuff sent out to you um diathermy Diathermy consumables are very cheap. I don't know what the cost of the machine is, but we're certainly we're looking to buy defibrillators and we're sending defibrillators out to units. Um, so there's no reason why we couldn't look at diathermy machines as well. So totally receptive to that. Um, what we need to do from our side, from Pace for Life, is we're just in the midst of trying to generate some um, funding streams within the UK. Um, although we can do that by recycling pacemakers that have got no battery life on them. So there's quite a lot going on behind the scenes. But I can, I'll can i have a chat to the other members about the diathermy side if people can't or don't have access to it. Yeah, that's a good one, definitely. Any more questions? Right. I think we should. Oh, right. 
Yeah, Dr. Sekrusi, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I think we're just going to wrap it up. This has been up absolutely fantastic. Um, it's just it's just the pace of it is 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 so good. You can follow it, and and it's so useful and practical. Um, and I know obviously um, that the, the consultants and the operators like we really appreciate this lecture. Um, I've, I've, been, I've enjoyed it, Julius. Cheers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So uh, yeah, we expect more from you. Uh, you said you could also follow it up with, um, was it recycling? Was that, you said there was another talk on something else? I a talk on, um, I gave a talk to my hospital on Friday on, I don't know how relevant you'll find it. Um, on the, the, so the European Society of Cardiology brought out guidelines on pacing and CRT in uh, 2021. So I've got a talk that I've given a few times on what the key things in the guidelines were okay. and what evidence has come out in the last couple of years. Now, some of it will be academically of interest, but practically, I imagine, of no interest because some of it is on conduction system pacing and his pacing and left area bund bundled pacing, which is still firmly in research demands but if you want if you wanted that talk as an overview of what's been going on in the world of pacing and where the big changes are i can do that well um dr daffy what do you think i think i, th I think that sounds all right <laughs> what do you think dr daffy we we can't hear you you're you're still on mute Oh, sorry, sorry. I was, I was, I was muted. I muted myself. I said that is very, very fine. That is good. Excellent. So, um, Dr. Telly, I mean, I don't know where your schedule is next Sunday because we don't have anything booked out um, for next Sunday yet. Uh, uh, next, yeah. It's not then, Easter, yeah, Easter, yeah, Easter, 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 the week after. Yeah. The week Dr. after. Andrew. Dr. Andrew. Yes. Sorry, there is this uh, this um, uh, theory that a plasma blade does if plasma blade uh, touches the uh, uh, the the lead, yeah, uh, it doesn't cut the lead. Yes. So but some people prefer that uh, during a um, uh, bad a uh, bus change, bus they pre uh, they prefer to use a uh, plasma blade. So yeah. that in case you mistakenly uh, uh, dissect into the lead, you will have a cut in the lead. What do you have to say on that, sir? Uh, utter garbage. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I, if you diathermy the box changes up until about two years ago, and never damaged one lead. So if you mm. use diatherm diathermy in a sensible way in short bursts you can dissect the leads without damaging them Good. If, you, if you use it in very long bursts touching the lead you'll you'll damage the insulation but saying that i sw i switched to um plasma blade for that very reason so i thought okay it's probably safer um i personally haven't damaged any leads with plasma blade but i've seen it happen so you can still damage your lead with plasma blade um and i think the downside of plasma blade is it the coagulation aspect of it is not very good at all if you could have yeah. if you could have a device that was combined that gave you the the cutting ability of plasma blade and the coagulation of diathermy that would be the perfect device um, okay. So we've gone. I've gone away from plasma blade after a couple of he big hematomas, which I am suspicious was the coagulation aspect of the plasma blade not working as well as diathermy. I may be wrong, but that's my own bias. Okay. Um, but you know everything you said about, about the you know how plasma blade is marketed and sold for those re uh, for exactly those reasons uh there's a question appeared yeah 
So it's antibiotics. Fine. Don't give any antibiotics routinely after a procedure. They don't do anything. So the, the key yeah. is just to give intravenous antibiotics before you do it. Um, so that is that is sufficient. They don't need any antibiotics to go home with as a routine as prophylaxis. Great. Brilliant. Excellent. Yeah. So that, that was really, really good. And um, I think we'll leave it at that. But um, certainly would like to invite you back again on the success of this one um, in a couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, what we'll do, Julius, I'll have a chat with you offline. I'll send you a WhatsApp okay. message and stuff and we can sort, sort things out. Okay, brilliant, brilliant. Excellent. Great. So thank you all for coming. Um, this has been absolutely fantastic. And we'd all like to say thank you to Dr. Tenley again. Um, for making the time to, to come in and give this amazing talk. So thank you. Thanks again. Cheers, everyone. Hopefully one of these days I'll be able to get out. Yeah. To yeah. We'll, we'll just pause. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. So, so there is, so just, just before you guys all go, um, the quiz. Thank you. Yeah. So AJ, AJ currently um, is on holiday, so he wasn't able to um, do the quiz. So we're going to do that quiz next week.